Okay, today we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Gospel of Matthew, and we come to chapter 24, and we begin our study in verse 8. Matthew 24, verse 8, and we will begin with prayer. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I said we're going to start our study in verse 8, but I want to start reading in verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive money, and ye shall hear of wars. And rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Well, the disciples should be figuring out right about now if they haven't already that Jesus isn't going to bring in good times and set up his kingdom right away like the Jews expected him to it should be obvious that he's not going to because he's talking about wars and disasters happening before he sets up his kingdom he's talking about wars and disasters and then he says they're just the beginning Wars and disasters suggest many years. And then it's still only the beginning. And I suppose the color is probably draining from their faces as it becomes painfully clear that the wonderful paradise kingdom promised in the Old Testament isn't going to happen right away. Verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Well, now Jesus' prophecy is really hitting close to home. It's getting personal now. Before it was these bad things are going to happen in the world. Now it is these bad things are going to happen to you, my people. Jesus said, people will hate you because you live for me. People will hate you because you preach my word. And like he says in the last part of verse 9, Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. In other words, it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter where you go. People are people. And people are sinners. And if you live for Jesus and tell people that he is the only way to heaven, there will be those who will hate you, so get ready. Jesus is warning. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended talking about being caused to stumble then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another so the persecution toward the end in some cases will be so bad that those who once claimed to be Christians will say not anymore not me I'm not a Christian anymore Jesus isn't my savior Jesus who who are you talking about? I tell you, I don't know the man. Because the price in being a Christian is too high, many will bail out. It has never been popular to be a Christian who is really sold out to Christ. And living for the Lord and speaking the truth, that has never been popular in this world. And it, it never has been popular, it never will be. However, those who are willing to put up with persecution who are willing to live holy, who are willing to speak the truth, and are willing to put up with persecution till the end, will be saved, said Jesus. 
verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity will abound, and love will wax cold. Sin will run wild everywhere in the world, near the end of the age. And where you have sin, you have a me-first attitude. I'm on the throne of my life, not God. I'm on the throne of my life, not you. I'm the one who's important. You better not get in my way, or I'm going to run you down. It's like Jesus said, when sin starts running wild, the love of many will grow cold. Sinners love self, not God, not others, and that makes for a lousy world. 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, I would not look at this verse as just being a warning. It is a warning, but it is also a promise. If you endure to the end, you will be saved. Now, that means if persecution comes and it gets bad, and you ever find yourself standing in front, in a, in front of a firing squad, or with your head on a chopping block because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you're in good shape. Or even if you find yourself lying in hospice and you're still holding to the belief that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord, you're blessed because you're saved. You have endured to the end. The next stop for you is heaven. See, I don't want to go to heaven right now. What's well, better than the alternative? 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And the end here... I believe refers to primarily to the end of the Israeli state because he's talking to the apostles and he's talking about the temple being destroyed and um, and so what he's saying here I believe is that the message of Jesus the good news that he will save anyone from hell who repents and receives him as Lord and Savior that good news was preached throughout the inhabited world before the wrath of God came crashing down on Jerusalem in 70 AD and speaking of that event, 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Jesus is now answering the question that they asked back in verse 3. The question was this, when will the temple be destroyed? Answer, when godless people desecrate it. When godless people are desecrating it, then it's about to be destroyed, and that happened in 70 A.D. The ungodly Romans desecrated the temple before they took it apart and destroyed it, block by block. So he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And this warning is for the Christians who will be alive in 70 AD, but there's a timeless principle that we can apply to our lives today. The warning is for Christians who will be alive in 70 AD. Jesus is saying, when you see the temple desecrated, get out of Jerusalem just as fast as you can. Those who believed the words of Jesus Christ and obeyed his instructions were spared. Those who did not believe those who did not obey suffered. And it's always that way. That's the timeless principle. It's always that way. Believe God's word. Follow his instructions on how to get to heaven or suffer in hell. Those who didn't believe Jesus, those who did not obey Jesus in 70 AD were destroyed. Those who don't receive Christ today will suffer eternal punishment. It always comes down to believing the word and acting on the word. That's what saves our souls. 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, and, in other words, what he is saying is, when it's time to run, run. 
and don't look back. Run and don't worry about your possessions. Don't go back into your house to pick up a few things before you head for the hills. Just head for the hills. When you see the temple being des desecrated, no matter where you are, take off running. And don't go back for anything. Escape with your life. Don't worry about your possessions. Sometimes it takes a tragedy for people to get their priorities straight. Some people's priorities are all messed up. You know, they pay more attention to their TVs, their music, their sports, their car, their business, than they do their families. But when fire hits or a tornado hits or a flood hits, they usually say the same thing. We lost everything, but thank God my family and I made it. What a pity it often takes a disaster to remind people about what's really important. But it does. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. That's saying an awful lot. It was bad in 70 A.D., when Rome demolished Jerusalem, 100,000 Jews were captured. 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered or starved to death. That was bad. It was bad when Hitler slaughtered millions of Jews during, during World War II. But those things were just a small taste of the suffering and death that will occur during the days before Jesus returns. I mean, it's going to be bad. It's going to be real bad. It's going to be the worst thing, the worst disaster, the worst carnage to ever hit this world. And when you think about all the famines and the plagues and the wars, and you figure in the Holocaust, and boy, and then you hear Jesus say that none of that stuff is as bad as what's going to hit this planet during the final days before Christ returns, you know it's going to be horrible. 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. If Christ doesn't intervene by his return, the world destroys itself. It just implodes upon its own moral rot. Sin rots and corrupts and destroys it. And what a lie sin is. Sin promises satisfaction, delivers misery, delivers death, it delivers rot. Sin, sin robs God's people of good times and goodness and good fruit. It is a destroyer. It is a thief. Sin destroys. And the only person who can rescue a life ravaged by sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. He does it for people today whenever they repent and receive Him as Lord and Savior. He will do it for the world at the end of the age when He returns. 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. During the tribulation, when times are so tough for Christians, Jesus warns, don't, don't, buy into the lies of some false Christ who's saying, I'm him. And he has to warn, because in times of trouble, people are vulnerable to slick talkers who promise a way out of their problem. And it's not going to be any different during the tribulation. God's people will be under tremendous pressure and will be suffering much persecution. And like today, there will be opportunists who would try to take advantage of it. People will say, I'm the Christ. I'm Jesus. I've returned. I'll save you. Just follow me. And send me your offerings. I'll save you. You say, well, people aren't that gullible, are they? People are that gullible. Even sincere, well-meaning people are that gullible. Do you remember, oh, this is probably maybe nine, ten years ago, something like that. Some false messiah was prompt, or was uh, predicting that the world was going to come to an end. But not to worry if you were one of his followers, you know, because he was in, in contact with some aliens from outer space, and they were going to swing by in their spaceship and, uh, and pick up his loyal followers if they purchased a ticket 
so they had to purchase a ticket from him, of course, and, and you know, oh, he filled the UFO. Of course, it never showed up, and the world never ended, but people are gullible. A lot of people are. 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. In that day, false Christ are going to be empowered by Satan to do miracles. And of course, the world loves anything supernatural, so people are going to flock, flock to these false teachers by the droves. And the same thing happens today. People are drawn to the supernatural, and Satan is more than happy to empower his ministers to do a few tricks to deceive people. And, you know, sometimes his ministers appear very nice, and their teachings can seem to make sense, and what they say can make people feel good. But when you examine what they say, and you examine closely, you'll find an error here, an error there. You'll see that it doesn't quite line up with Scripture in this place and in that place. And whenever you see that, that is the warning siren of the Holy Spirit to get away and to warn others to get away. Miracles are not. Get away from them. So Jesus' warning, don't, even if somebody does miracles, don't buy into it if what they say contradicts the Word of God. 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Now remember, Jesus is warning his people not to be taken in. It's going to be tough to be one of God's people in the final days. People will want Jesus to return really bad and to deliver them from the mess and the persecution. And so, God's people may be tempted to believe some of those slick-talking, smiling, false Christs. Jesus warns, don't believe them. You know, sometimes people want someone or something to be a certain way so bad that they make believe it is that way, even though deep down inside they know it isn't. It's crazy, but it's true. Life is way too short to play Let's Pretend. Life is wasted, poor decisions are made, life becomes a silly child's game with disastrous results when we don't live in reality and we don't deal with reality. 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You'll know it when Jesus returns, you'll know it. You won't miss his return if you're alive. The next time some false messiah, you know, some David Koresh type says, I'm the Christ, I hope I'm able to look him in the eye and say, that's funny, I didn't see you flash across the sky like lightning. You're a liar. Because Jesus said that's how he's returning. He said everybody's going to see him. Nobody saw you flash. Verse 28. For whosoever or wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. When Jesus returns, two things are going to happen. Number one, he's going to set up his kingdom for the redeemed. Number two, this world system and the people who oppose God and the Lord Jesus Christ will be judged, killed, and sent to hell. Those are the two things that are going to happen. And Jesus, in here in verse 28, he says, uh, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And what, that ta what that's talking about is this, the, the evil Christ-rejecting sinners represent the carcasses. And the flesh-eating eagles represent God's judgment. In other words, Jesus is saying God's judgment is going to pick the wicked apart like a vulture picks apart a carcass when Jesus returns. Verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. On the day that Jesus returns, now, now watch this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, when it's all over, then it says the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, 
and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun's going to be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. On the day that Jesus returns, the Big Dipper is going to scatter. Orion is going to lose his belt. The Pleiades are going to explode. The North Star probably will be in the south. And all the stars and all the planets. The night sky is going to be chaos. And in the daylight, well, it's not going to look like daylight because the sun's going to grow dark. So everybody's going to be looking up. And then after God has everyone's attention and everyone is looking up, that's when verse 30 happens. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The people of the earth will mourn because they opposed Jesus Christ, and they lost, and they know it. People sin because they want to. And because they think they can get away with it. And then when it's too late to change, because the consequences of their sin have caught up to them, then they mourn. Shouldn't have never done it. Wish I never would have done it. They mourn because they know they've been foolish. They mourn because they wish they would have lived God's way. Sooner or later, all who rebel against God and reject the Savior will mourn. 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. God's people who somehow, by God's grace, will manage to survive the terrible persecution are going to have the ride of their lives. God has more angels than you can count, you know. And on that day, God will send his angels out across the world, and they will transport all of his people to Israel. And once there, God's people will get their first close-up look at the Savior. We're going to know what he looks like. He's returned, and we're there. And once we get our first look at him, it's going to be great, because we're going to welcome him to earth, and then the new heavens and the new earth will be ushered in. 32. Now learn a parable from the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Well... We don't know that, because we live in Wisconsin. But in Wisconsin, we know summer is near when the lilac bushes start to sprout leaves. In Israel, it was the fig tree that sprouted. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Wars and natural disasters, like we saw last time, do not mean that the return of Christ is about to happen. There really isn't going to be a whole lot of warning before Jesus returns. He will return, the Bible says, like a thief in the night. But when the stars and the planets start doing strange things, when, when they start shaking and the sun and the moon begin to go dark, then you know Jesus is right around the corner. 34. <clears throat> and so he says right here, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In other words, the generation that's alive, when all these fearful and strange things begin to happen in the sky, that generation will see the return of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is stressing in verse 34. He's saying, you know, you, you people who are alive, when, that's, when the stars start bouncing all over the place and the sun goes dim, you shouldn't kid yourself and think that I'm not on the doorstep because I am. You need to get in a hurry here. You need to hurry and get right with God before it's too late. And you know what? The return of Jesus Christ is imminent. The stars in the sky could start bouncing around tonight. And Jesus could be here by the morning. 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Psalm 119.85 Forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven. The word of God is our anchor. Don't ever forget it. What it says about God, what it says about Jesus, what it says about heaven, what it says about hell, what it says about salvation is true and will always be true. You can't trust anything 
as much as you can trust the Word of God. That's why if something goes against the Word of God, reject it. Flat out, reject it. No, no matter who you might have to disappoint in the process, reject it. Because it's not true. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. God has promised to preserve His Word. Next time we pick it up in verse 36. Until then, so long everyone.